And I have uh, a pair of glasses here. <laughs> I think in terms of talking about dementia-friendly communities, I think the real challenge is, is the magnitude of the, the problem that we're looking at. There's been a lot of discussion around the, the healthcare system and what's broken in the healthcare system, what doesn't work. When we're talking about age-friendly or dementia-friendly communities, we're broadening that out even further. And that can seem overwhelming. Now we're talking about housing, generally housing, transportation issues are being huge, infrastructure that is was designed the wrong way 30 years ago, we're living with, we have to retrofit. So it can become really overwhelming. And when you work with communities, it's kind of like, oh, gosh, where are we going to start? I think the opportunity in Canada is, is that we can build on other movements. So dementia friendly can link to, for example, age friendly. Age friendly has, Canada was a leader, has been a leader. We have strengths in that area. Why not merge it with that to become a leader in dementia friendly? I don't think it would be such a small step. I'm looking at Gloria Gottman over there. I don't think you would agree that we could be the leader quite easily by merging the two movements. Good. Alex. So, so I think overall, obviously, you know, my, my point of view is technology is a, is a huge opportunity for us to fill a lot of the gaps that have been discussed today. Right from the, you know, providing care in the home to the, to the older adult, providing support to the families and the caregivers, and also a great opportunity for use of technology to support uh, staff and residents in long-term care facilities or, or other institutions. Um, however, in terms of mobilizing this, you know, my ch the, the challenge I'm going to throw out there is also my opportunity, and that is the big challenge is there's a lack of a receptor community in the area of technology for dementia. And what I mean by receptor community is there are no companies currently knocking on any of our doors saying, hey, my core business is technology for people with dementia. Let's get together and do something. You know, there's no companies in Canada that's doing that. And Canada is definitely behind with that respect when compared to the United States and Europe. You look at the U.S., Last year, in, in the top three portfolios of investment from venture capitalists, technology for seniors and cognitive impairment actually was in that top three. It's nowhere close anywhere in Canada. There's no, there's no one doing that. Now, in terms of how that's an opportunity, you can see that there, there's a huge potential for an economic sector that we can build with the right support, the right infrastructure, and the right incentives to do that, which could truly, you know, help move Canada in, forward in that capacity and become an international leader. But again, from an economic point of view, you know, it can have a, a massive upside to it uh, when we look at just from that purely financial aspect. Great. Look forward to that. Pat? Uh, I can't help uh, commenting on physical space. We were in a place in Norway, this huge development. Now, the they have used their oil money for this, but the nursing home was physically in a building that had the town Olympic-sized swimming pool, a rock climbing wall, the town cinema, a restaurant, uh, and was across the square from the shopping center and the church. And uh, they said, you, you didn't have to put your shoes on to go to any of these facilities. And it was extraordinary. You know, the kids could go swimming. You could take the kids swimming and visit mom or mom. Mom could go and watch the kids swimming without, uh, without leaving uh, the uh, whole physical space. And um, the location of homes, in the 50s, we started to put them all out to pasture. And... Uh, it, I remember in Yorkville, they had a nursing home that people were outraged in the 60s that there was a nursing home in the middle of York. And when they actually asked the residents, they said, it's fantastic. There's so much going on to watch. And, uh, and in a place we were in in Manitoba, that was right beside a beautiful stream and they fed the animals and everything. Residents were as likely to go to the window that watched the shopping center as they were to watch the stream. Uh, that's the first point. The second point I just wanted to make a short one is that I think we need to focus less on solving the problems by adding more rules, more paperwork, and more reporting, and spend more time creating the conditions that allow for good care and trust relationships. Suggesting less paperwork in Canada? <laughs> really? Well, <laughs> it's amazing teasing. that you can actually provide Canada. care with it. <laughs> 
I just want to pick up on Pat's last thing about uh, providing better care with less paperwork, but also focusing on the relations of care. And I think that's what um, certainly I have come to learn in, in research is that uh, this relationship uh, and the relations of the resident is what's driving their positive outcomes. And I think we have the opportunity to improve that if we go back to this morning and think about if, if older people are living so much longer and the, 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 scare or the fear of getting dementia is lessened because we're able to live better with it, then we will also be able to draw on what they desire to have in when they need more care, whether it's in the home or in the long-term care facility. I think one of the challenges, though, is the infrastructure that we currently have. Relationships can be built and provided within uh, existing old infrastructure, but it's a lot easier, particularly from from my research, to enable those relationships when you have smaller sized uh, um, areas and you're enabling interaction among um, among the residents and the family and so on. Good. Thank you, panel. The floor is open. We've had a lot of very exciting presentations these last uh, half hour. Questions, comments. Uh, Rick Riopel, uh, McGill. Um, <clears throat> that last comment really resonated with me um, because Alex started off talking about d disruptive technology. What you've just said is uh, disruptive patient engagement. And, and that, for me, is absolutely key. Uh, <clears throat> of course, we're going to hear that tonight from David uh, with respect to Chapter 5 of the Innovation Panel Report. Very good. While people are uh, gathering their thoughts, Alex, it occurred to me, bringing two things together, that uh, Janet Fast told us that there is 930 plus million lost productivity in the workforce um, for people caring. One would have to think that technology should address that, or at least address some opportunity. And the other part of it is just to make it clear that, or to remind people that when Prime Minister Cameron brought together the G7 summit, he included a lot of the large companies in the UK, British Telecom and large employers, recognizing that they were facing problems and they needed to be at the table to help find solutions. So I don't know if you see that, those links as a way to kind of mobilize around the same problem. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, in terms of the technology supporting, you know, those individuals to remain at work um, and to remain productive, you know, it's almost, you know, we need to a bit shift our thinking a bit when it comes to the technology piece that, you know, for a long time we've been, rightly so, making the argument that technology is good because it can improve quality of life. And we're very quickly finding out that for me to go to an investor or even to a government and say, I'm going to build this technology because it's going to improve the quality of life of this person is going to get me nowhere. We need to make the economic case now for why this technology is important. I think, you know, the, the, the notion around work is very important that if we can actually improve the productivity of your worker because we're providing technology that's going to help them remain there. And while at the same time, the technology is providing care now to their family members or loved one, whoever it may be. That's kind of maybe our in now, and that's kind of what we're starting to think a bit more. It's unfortunately, it's a very cold, harsh approach we need to take uh, at this now, but I think it's that business approach we have to do in order to start making some strides in the area. Very good. Larry? Larry Jambers <clears throat> with the uh, Alzheimer's Society of Canada. <clears throat> I just wanted to make two or three comments. One is that the average age of, with the, of a person with dementia in Canada is 80, um, so it's, it's totally entangled with, uh, with being older. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments about the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. <clears throat> we have uh, 60 organizations across the country and we're in about 150 communities. And what's really significant about that is that all of them were grassroots organizations where the, the community got together and, and decided to mobilize itself. And in public health, we call uh, improving the health of the public um, 
uh, uh, organized efforts to c improve the health of the public. Um, so the way I think about this is how can we organize the community? How can we mobilize the community? And I, I, I think I was frustrated with the previous panel because there, as a taxpayer, I have trouble um, thinking about putting more money in the health service. Maybe it's reallocation of services, but I don't think we train our health professionals to think enough about how volunteers in the community, how volunteer organizations um, can be mobilized, um, volunteers within uh, corporations in the, comp in the community. Um, we now have a we have much more knowledge about management of volunteers, management of organizations that uh, that do this. Uh, I worked in cardiovascular area, and we were able to mobilize those those agencies in the community that were specialists in volunteers, and we're able to reduce the uh, hospitalization of cardiovascular disease by by nine percent. So I think when we're talking about the the challenges for Canada, I think the the national dementia plan. Has to has to um, think broader than the healthcare system has already been mentioned, um, and we have to we have to think basically. I, I think now in, in my present job with with three three groups in the community, those people that have had no experience with dementia or long term care or aging for whatever reason, and they tend to be the younger people. Then there's the group of people who I call the train wreck. They um, they find that. Of loved one all of a sudden isn't able to think straight, trying to find their way through the system. And then there's a third group, uh, people who are, are really getting tired after eight or more years of caring for the person with dementia. And I think from a community awareness point of view, uh, we heard um, Chris Frank over here saying, well, you know, how are we going to change people's expectations? I think one of the dementia plan challenges would be awareness with those three groups of better understanding our community and uh, how we could go beyond the health system and think of this as a, a truly community problem. Brina, uh, do you want to make a comment? Can I just, um, just to the, the volunteer aspect, and while I agree with you that there's certainly lots of opportunities for volunteers, we also know that there's volunteer burnout uh, volunteers, there's a shrinking number of volunteers. A lot of community organizations are hugely struggling with getting volunteers, and those that volunteer are volunteering more. So that's one thing. So maybe there are creative ways to engage other people, but it, it's going to take creativity. But the other thing that I, frankly bothers me sometimes about the volunteer argument is that we're offloading responsibility onto yet again uh, volunteers. And so there's certain responsibilities, I think, that are part of the collective rather than saying, you know, you do it. So I think we need to be cautious about that. I just want to add something about volunteers. I think that we have to recognize that everybody who provides care needs some kind of training. Uh, we heard this from maintenance workers and and, uh, and laundry workers that they wanted training in uh dementia care, and that's as true for volunteers as others, it seems to me. But also volunteers, are, we hear over and over again, aren't reliable. <laughs> you know, you think that they're going to, to, to do the work, and they that's not their job, and so tomorrow they might not come. And then what do you do uh, if you uh, if you rely on them? It's particularly the case that we're told with, with younger ones. And the third thing I wanted to say is we have, we think that one indicator of a uh, a nursing home that that really is working well is the number of volunteers, that more people volunteer in good places to work, uh, it, it, where at least that's in our experience, than ones that aren't. So again, we're back to creating a place that works well in the first place. Very good. We have time for one more question. Gloria Gutman. Gloria Gutman from International Longevity Center Canada and SFU Gerontology Research Center. I just was very surprised that that none of you on the panel drew attention to Hodgeway, that village that's just outside of Amsterdam that we're hearing a lot about and that is supposed to be designed to be dementia friendly. So my first question is that one. Uh, why didn't you mention it? And, and uh, <laughs> the second question or, uh, actually relates to 
uh, CMHC. CMHC for a number of years has produced guidelines and documents on design for dementia, both within how to, how to um, make your home dementia friendly if you're a home caregiver, uh, and also some guidelines on institutional uh, design. And we have some good examples in Canada, and we always try, we always seem to look to abroad rather than than uh, looking within the country. And the point that was made earlier this morning about we are a country of pilot projects, there's some very good pilot projects <laughs> that deal with design for and, and safe environments for people with dementia. But I, I was surprised that you didn't mention those uh, and or raised the question that um, often goes with people that are lauding these, these examples of the fact that uh, the people that they may be dealing with are those who are still in early stages and who are able to walk around. Very good. Is the panel familiar with the home and then if you want to just comment on it, just tell people what it is first so they... Me? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, you can fill in the blanks. I mean, I think one of the, one of the challenges, I think you're raising some very good points. There's a lot of research out there around, um, design for people with dementia and the particular community you spoke about has gotten a lot of press in Canada in particular at the globe, uh, right up. Um, I, one of the challenges I think is being able to, uh, assess what are the true outcomes of, of what's happening and how they're evolving over time when we were just saying, well, we haven't visited there, so we don't, you know, we're, we're looking at it from uh, lenses out, but it's actually a community where people live with dementia. It's, it's a community where the residents have dementia and are able to uh, participate as they do in a safe environment without restrictions. I guess that would be my, um, my easiest and simplest, uh, for, pardon me? The walls are around the community. The, the walls are around the community. Um, and so there's, you know, there are some, there's probably, uh, positives and negatives that, that Verena can talk about a bit more about it. But I, I do want to say that there are, a huge number of assessment tools that are out there, both in terms of uh, hospital-friendly dementia facilities, long-term care uh, dementia uh, facilities, uh, community programs for dementia. Uh, in six to eight minutes, it's very hard to cover them all. Um, and so I think that's that has been one of the uh, panel's challenges. But okay. do you have anything to add, Brina? No, I think we'll we'll pause there because um, Kate is giving me quite intensive signals that it's time to pause. So let me then thank the panel on your behalf and